Hi, good morning everyone. My name's Khalid. Uh, I look after sales and growth at VTEX. Uh, for those who don't know, VTEX is a 20-year-old publicly listed software as a service solution and we provide digital commerce, marketplace and OMS capabilities. We power around 3,400 online stores across the world, across 38 countries for many of the world's leading brands and some of the brands that I've been talking here today are actually VTEX clients. So the idea of today's session is uh, I just want to share with you initially for the first 10 or 12 minutes uh, an interesting study that we did. Uh, one of the things that we do at VTEX in order to give our clients a uh, competitive advantage is we periodically do a deep dive kind of study with a lot of our key clients to try and understand their current challenges or problems that they're facing today and the problems that they see on the horizon and likewise the opportunities that they are trying to unlock today and the opportunities that they see on the horizon. And what we do from this learning essentially is we bake those particular solutions to unlocking those opportunities or challenges into our service, into our solution, so that hopefully our clients have a competitive advantage. And I want to share with you today uh, some findings from our very recent, recent study. And essentially, I want to put a spotlight on three bets that VTEX and our customers are making to drive uh, profitability in, in e-commerce. But before I do that, I want to just set the scene, if I may, and essentially just set the scene of where we are today. The last three years for digital commerce has been unprecedentedly turbulent. I mean, we've had the COVID roller coaster and all the problems that COVID brought along with it. Digital commerce, interestingly, was one of the few areas that actually had a smile on their faces with COVID, where the world was suffering. Digital commerce saw a massive uptick for obvious reasons that we all understand. And we saw commerce grow significantly, multiples of five, six, seven, eight times in, in some cases, in some brands. But of course, we're now almost at the hangover stage of the after party of, of COVID, whereby what we're seeing now is a softening of demand. Uh, where in the UK, according to the ONS, I mean, e-commerce, digital sales as a percentage of total retail sales were roughly 30% at the height in COVID. It's dropped, softened now to around 26%. And so what we've got now is a situation where we've got softened demand and we've got some really challenging microeconomic conditions in the next two or three years that we're all aware of. High inflation, the cost of living crisis, energy crisis that we, we see, and lots of supply chain disruption. What about for many reasons, not least the current conflict that's going on now in, in Ukraine that's affecting supply chains. This is putting a lot of pressure on merchants, people in the e-commerce space, and what we're seeing now is a shift. Because of this pressure, merchants now are more focused on profitability. When COVID kicked in, there was a big focus on growth. Everybody wanted to basically acquire these new customers that were suddenly rushing to buy online. Now that demand has softened, there's a lot of pressure on people that run e-commerce businesses to focus on profitability. And this is where we are today. And talking to our customers, they highlight three problems that they're seeing today. The first problem that they tell us is the cost, and we heard earlier some conversations around the cost of acquiring customers. So the cost of getting people to your online sites now is quite difficult. And we've heard about things like Apple in our iOS 14.5, their app trans transparency tracking and Google uh, deprecating the uh, cookie in, in, in the next couple of years, third party cookies, making it much more harder to track buyers for you to identify the right targets to get them to your site. And secondly, because we're seeing people opting out essentially of being tracked, it's becoming much more expensive and difficult to find the right audience for you to pitch you, and it's quite expensive. So that's a big challenge that they're facing. The second problem they're telling us is what they call inventory chaos. With supply chain disruptions, we're reading almost every fortnight about brands that have gone under. I mean, only two weeks ago, I'm a keen cyclist. We heard about the big cycling distributor that basically went under because of supply chain problems. So this is a real challenge that businesses are facing now, is, is how they manage their inventory. And the third thing is something, it's kind of the dirty secret of e-commerce. When e-commerce first gained prominence, people used to think, oh, well, this is really easy. You don't have to set up a physical store. You don't have all the headache that you have with physical stores. Set up a website and you start selling. It's easy peasy. 
but one thing that uh, people in the industry know is it's very, very difficult to get customers, not only to get customers to the site, and then for you to have the right inventory available at the time, for you to be able to deliver, to meet their very exacting expectations, but then finally to get them to complete their checkout funnel and go right to the end of the journey and basically press buy. Cart abandonment is very, very high. Unless you're in the industry, people don't realize, but I mean, the current figures are roughly on desktop. 69% uh, of all journeys basically abandon the carts on desktop. And if you look at mobile, it's as high as 85%. So getting clients, customers to convert is really difficult. These are three big problems that our clients have, have told us about. And we basically, working with our clients, are gonna make three bets uh, over there. With this event is called the Future of Commerce. So in the immediate future, these are three bets we as VTEX are making along with our clients that are designed to address the current situation that we're in right now. And we think these bets are gonna basically drive uh, profitability in e-commerce. The first one is retention is a new acquisition. As I said, in the big e-commerce COVID problem, everyone was falling over one another to try and attract new customers. And we've heard a lot today about the problems in basically acquiring new customers. The cost of acquisition is really high. Businesses now, we are betting, are going to double down. It sounds obvious, but this has not been the case. People have been fighting, always to try and acquire new customers. What we're realizing now is actually, there's research that shows that 80% of a brand's repeat business usually is delivered by 20% of their customers. Those brand ambassadors who are buying more frequently with larger average order values. To focus on those, those particular customers, to get them to increase you know, to do another order per fortnight, per week, per month, per quarter, per year, given their average order values, often is actually more economically attractive than trying to acquire new customers that are very difficult to find today. So there's a big push now for retention over acquisition. And there's a lot of strategies that are being deployed by brands, uh, particularly in the marketing space, to try and get a, a much better conversation dialogue going, a better understanding of those brand ambassadors. So the big focus now is on retention, is looking inward uh, to look at how they can basically have you know, different strategies, loyalty as an example, how they can get closer to those brand ambassadors. Along with that, we've heard a lot about you know, iOS, Apple, Google, third-party data. There's a big move now to try and collect first-party data. Brands now are kind of thinking about what strategies, what tactics they need to deploy in order for them to attract first-party data themselves. So there's different strategies that they're deploying, but certainly uh, as they get closer to those customers, uh, they want to make sure that they've got first-party data themselves that they can use. And the third, the third thing that they're also doing is trying to be kind of more having deeper and broader conversations with their clients. So basically, not just communicating via one channel. If you know anything about the shopping journey, it's multifaceted. It's no longer a linear kind of journey. So buyers are interacting with brands on different touch points, in different channels. So brand, businesses are trying really hard now to try and be channel agnostic and broaden the way that they're communicating. But essentially, the message is now, it's, it's basically about retention. Retention is a new acquisition. The second bet that we are making, along with our merchants, is around fulfillment. Fulfillment is always seen as like kind of an unnecessary operation, a requirement in order to fulfill the customer journey. It's something that doesn't really get a lot of attention. It's kind of seen by those other people that work in the back office, that work in the warehouse, you know, that deal with that kind of stuff. But what we're seeing is that uh, merch merchants in Vitex were doubling down on making fulfillment, treating fulfillment like a product. When you have a product, you basically advertise it with pride, front and center, every opportunity you're marketing. And we're seeing brands doing this now where they're trying to basically market fulfillment in terms of the sustainability, uh, you know, your options that you offer, the convenience, et cetera, making it front and center in, in all your marketing. The other thing that people are doing is unifying inventory. Lots of businesses have got so much opportunity under their noses, but sometimes struggle to leverage that latent opportunity. And I'm talking about siloed inventory. So lots of e-commerce businesses today, you'll be really surprised, have physical stores, many physical stores with wide assortment, a range of products, but are unable for different reasons to surface that inventory on their online shopping experience. So when customers come to a site, Unbeknown to them, often they are just getting feedback from a particular warehouse that's dedicated to e-commerce or a couple of warehouses. 
there's lots of inventory available in businesses, lots of opportunities for you to differentiate with inventory, but it's all siloed. So unifying inventories is a massive opportunity that is uh, available to businesses, that, which is what they're trying to make a difference with, with uh, inventory. And the third thing is marketplaces. Given the challenges we know about inventory, and it's costly and expensive to buy, acquire products, to basically get those products shipped over, all the regulation, taxes, shipping, storage, insurance, and hundreds of other things that I could think of. Whereas with a marketplace business model, businesses can essentially become more relevant to their customers, offer a wider product assortment by adding complementary products from complementary vendors, and using strategies like drop shipping, where they're not necessarily responsible for that difficult task of basically, and costly task of shipping the products, they can put that onus or responsibility onto the merchants who are selling those particular products. So having a marketplace strategy is really, really smart, okay? You can really broaden, and then there's lots of different ways of monetizing that particular sale, but most fundamentally, what you're doing is you're becoming more sticky, more relevant to your particular customers. You're becoming that one-stop destination where they can know yours is a destination to go to. Not only can they buy your first-party products, but you've also got third-party products. So marketplaces is, is a big bet that we're making, and we are seeing, we talk to a lot of customers. Last year, we transacted more than just under $13 billion worth of business through our, through our business. So we speak to a lot of clients, and I can tell you now, Marketplace is one of the biggest, fastest trends that's happening right now in the e-commerce space. And the third bet we're making, put your merchants breach the fourth wall. I was just telling someone, I'm, I'm a big movie fan, and if you go back to the days of silent cinema with people like Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, uh, in those days, watching these types of films was a very kind of binary experience. You know, when they got really creative, they'd have a pianist in, in the auditorium, but it's basically a silent movie. Yet today we're in the age of, you know, James Cameron inspired, you know, high frame rate, uh, IMAX, uh, 4D, uh, movies like Avatar and, and these uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. What this reflects is the needs of the current consumer, right? The current consumer today does, is, doesn't want to be a spectator. They want to be involved. It's, it's come from a spectator support shop into a, what I describe as a, a full contact sport. And just how cinema has gone from kind of let's say, spectator to full immersion. It's taken them 125, 130 years. In e-commerce, we've gone in a short space of 20 to 25 years to essentially uh, a situation today where e-commerce is far more immersive. And the, one of the bets that we're making is basically for merchants to start and invest in video. And research shows that any visitor to our e-commerce site who basically plays a video is two times more likely to convert. And we're seeing a lot of investment in video, whether that's one-to-one. -one. You may have read two weeks ago, Apple announced that they've basically got a service where you can essentially have a personal shopper over video to help you buy an, an Apple iPhone. Or you could have what we do. We do a lot of live shopping. We've got brands, Motorola, Samsung, as an example, clients of ours that are doing a one-to-many video experience. So we find video is a massive bet. It's immersive. Uh, people love watching videos. And we think this is a, a really important bet that brands are making that's going to allow them to differentiate. The second thing that they're doing also is the product detail page. We put a lot of emphasis on bringing people to our site, and often a lot of energy goes on the landing page. However, after the landing page, one of the most important from our research pages on a customer journey on an e-commerce site is the product detail page, which is often overlooked. It's often seen as a page where you put specifications, sizes, etc., but not enough thought goes into differentiating on the product detail page. And we're seeing, again, from a creative customer journey perspective, brands doubling down on their product detail pages. And thirdly, along with this, breaching this fourth wall, making commerce more interactive, one of the biggest barriers we often hear about is technological limitations. E-commerce technology is moving really, really fast. So we see brands doubling down now on, on getting the right kind of technology stack, making sure that your stack is agile. When I say agile, i just give you an example how cinema took 125 years to go from Charlie Chaplin to James Cameron, as an example. Uh, E-commerce has done the same thing in 23, 24 years. And this is a common trend. If you look at other industries, you'll see exactly the same. The rate of change in technology is exponential. So 
to have the right technology stack that allows you to react. We don't, I mean, I can't stand here and guarantee, tell you what the shopping experience is gonna be like in three, four years. That's why we call these bets. These are the bets that we're making, but I don't really know what's truly gonna happen. But you need to make sure that your investments in technology are such that when a change happens, you are able to basically be agile and, and move and, and not make technology a limitation. So to summarize, these are the three bets, okay, where we talked about acquisition, retention, uh, Acquisition, retention being the, the new acquisition. We've talked about inventory being a differentiator. Uh, fulfillment taking center stage. And we've talked about merchants breaching the fourth wall, i.e. becoming more immersive. At the back of these uh, flyers, these brochures that Kadasha have produced is a barcode. If you want to read more, I've just given you a quick highlight in 14 minutes. But there's a detailed study we've done. We spoke to a lot of our clients across the world. Please feel free to download it. You might find it interesting. I've spoke a bit too much. I want to invite on stage one of our key clients, uh, Motorola. I want to invite James Atkins, who's the head of e-commerce. And perhaps James can share with us some of his insights on, on some of the topics that we mentioned. James. So James heads e-commerce uh, across EMEA for, uh, and marketing for, for Motorola. James, thank you for joining us. Uh, a few years ago, Motorola embarked on a pretty big uh, transformation around its digital commerce. Can you please talk us through what the landscape was like at Motorola at the time? What was it that drove you to basically decide that, you know what, we need to rethink commerce? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, good morning. Um, full disclosure, uh, Gustavo said at the beginning that uh, the brightest minds of the industry are here. Unfortunately, that guy from Motorola couldn't make it. Um, <laughs> and so you have me. And as such, I have a cheat sheet. So if you see me looking down, I'm not nodding off. I'm just checking off. I've, uh, I've got all the points that I wanted to make. Um, so the, la the landscape that we had uh, pre our e-commerce journey, um, I, looking in the audience, I, 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 I hope it's fairly safe to say most people have heard of, of Motorola. We are an iconic brand that's been through, through ups and downs. And due to the changing dynamics of the market, uh, technology evolution, the rise of, of smartphones and Android, our, um, our global footprint took on um, a sort of an unusual shape, should we say. So in markets that are traditionally maybe tech leading, we weren't as strong, and in markets that were potentially playing catch up, we had a really strong um, footprint. And this started to skew a number of things. Yes, yes, from a sales perspective, it was frustrating, but also from that, the, the, the customer feedback, we were, you know, in markets where the, the technology maybe wasn't as advanced, the feedback was, you know, as expected, maybe not as futuristic as we would want it to be uh, and expect it to be in other markets. And in markets that were sort of technical or leading the way from a technical point of view, our, um, our range penetration, the, the number of devices you could get access to in the market were such that, um, you know, t I'm just going to give an example, it's easier. Take the UK, for example, where we are. Um, w our range had kind of moved into that value-add, low-cost space. So you could buy a Motorola in Tesco's or in Argos. And the feedback you get from that kind of customer experience and that kind of journey is different from a thousand pound foldable phone that, that is where we aspired to be. So the market is feeding back saying, oh, we, we need it cheaper, we need it, you know, we need it to, to, to have less memory so that we can hit this price point, this price point. But as a tech brand, we have aspirations to be something else. And so for us, the e-commerce journey was not just a route to market or another route to market, but it was this opportunity to kind of create this, this feedback loop from, from consumers, this direct, um, this direct uh, feedback. Um, and, and particularly for us, who you know, we, we've made some investments into uh, technology in recent years, and we have a real desire to kind of, I, I say re-enter. For Europe, it's re-enter. For the rest of the world, it's just continue as normal. But re-enter that sort of aspirational high-end uh, high space. And definitely e-commerce has, has allowed to do that. The problem that we faced was that we had no direct-to-consumer um, infrastructure. Uh, we had no experience in, se um, in selling to... Um, in, in to selling to, to end consumers. And so for us, we were kind of at a bit of a loss as to, to how we move forward. Th thank you. And, and when you made that decision uh, and that realization, buying technology is very difficult. It's a very <clears throat> convoluted uh, market. How did you kind of figure out or work through 
the technology that you needed to help you achieve your ambitions? Yeah, um, and, and I think the, <laughs> the answer to that question is you, you don't know what you don't know, right? And, and that was our biggest problem, is the world of e-commerce for a brand that is not in it is, is a very scary world, um, full of acronyms and, 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 and at the pace of, of change that is you know, crazy, even for a tech, tech firm. So we knew what we, we, knew what we did want. Um, we had become pretty good from a brand perspective um, of creating content on our brand sites. Um, as a global brand, we had centralized a lot of the framework for doing that. Um, and being able to adapt it and localize it in, you know, many, many different languages is no mean feat. And so we had developed this sort of library of content that we didn't want to move away from. We didn't want to kind of scrap everything and, and, and start again. So we had this, we had this kind of core uh, brand assets that we wanted to maintain. And, you know, we, we knew that our business was different in each geo, right? So Europe's very different to North America. LATAM is our, our absolute kind of jewel in the crown for us. So LATAM, we're 22, 23% market share. Um, so we wanted to also be um, mindful of the existing partnerships that were in place. So how are we fulfilling at a local level? How are we working with partners? Are we using distributors? Are we selling direct? And there was this kind of real complex landscape um, and because of the, the nature of our business, Brazil had already started doing some um, e-commerce uh, or direct-to-consumer sales. So we kind of assembled a, um, a delegation from other geos led by the US, which is where our, our brand is, is based, um, and went over to Brazil as a bit of a fact-finding mission. And, and as part of that, we, we kind of got to know the Vtex team who were working with... Um, working with Brazil, and it, it was through them that we, we sort of identified, okay, this is where we um, you know, lack knowledge, this is where we have content, this is what we, we need to do to kind of fill that gap. And they kind of held our hand through the process of what we need to do to bring this global framework to local markets in a, yeah, in a quick and meaningful way. And, I, well, I, and I, I, I sort of, I, I say quick because for us, like fast revenue was, was important for us. You, we had a big project internally of, okay, we're gonna turn e-commerce on, but as I'm sure most of you will also experience, you don't get a sort of a two year runway to do that. You know, you have to suddenly show a return if you're making investments. So uh, another part of that was, was being able to, um, to, to turn it on in multiple countries pretty quickly. Thank you. And what, would you, what were the main challenges that you faced? So you, you, you've understood what you need to do. You've kind of figured out what you thought was the right technology that you needed. When you embarked on that journey, what were the main challenges that you encountered? I think, um, so, so there were kind of three that I, I, I listed down. So our existing customers, marketing, and our internal culture. And I thought it was interesting some of the, the conversations that were there this morning is, you can't, or what we found is, you, you can't just turn e-commerce on as a channel that sits alone from everything else. Um, we are a B to C, you, you know, sorry, we're a B to B to C kind of organization. So we're selling to Currys and Vodafone and this, that, the other. And as soon as you start talking about turning on your e-commerce, they are quite quick to say, hang on, that's cannibalizing our business. And so it was being able to develop a pricing structure that they were comfortable with. You know, we are not there to price lead. That's not the objective of our, of our e-commerce, as, as I've said. It's about, um, you know, spreading the net wider and kind of explaining that if we can grow the brand, you're going to benefit overall. We talked about, you know, where do you see that advertising and what does that mean in terms of your purchase journey? And, and the answer is it doesn't really matter as long as you see it and as long as you transact somewhere. So everyone's, um, everyone's engaged. Um, from a marketing perspective, uh, this is awful because I, um, I was the EMEA marketing director, but our, our sort of call to action dumped a customer somewhere and we were kind of like, well, that, that's... That's that done then. So, you know, we put a customer into a shop and we're like, well, crack on. And suddenly we had to think, well, hang on, we've got to manage this customer journey all the way through, not just to purchase, but through to support, you know, and, and, and retention uh, moving forward. So we had to redesign the way we marketed with much more of a conversion element to it. So how are we really switching those, those sales on? 
And then from a cultural perspective, which I think is the biggest point, is you have to rethink how you, well, you, we had to restructure our business. So e-commerce for us doesn't sit as a standalone channel. Um, it actually sits within marketing, and we don't have a single e-commerce P&L. Our P&Ls are at a country level, so we don't compete with the countries. We are, we are partnered with them. Um, there are some battles around how marketing budgets are created, but it's, yeah, it's fairly easy if we put some parameters in that says this is how much revenue we're generating, we're going yeah, to take a percentage of that. But we, we, we restructured the, 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 kind of, um, the way we went to market for this um, particular activity. And you know, as a result, we've, we've, we've developed a fairly flexible structure. So I think when we started, we rolled out 37 sites straight away. I mean, today we've got 25 sites in Europe, um, 10 of which are e-commerce, but the, the remainder that aren't e-commerce, that are brand sites, are on Vtex, and they're ready to turn on as soon as we need to, which I'll come to in a, in a second if I get asked a question like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how convenient. <laughs> so what's next? Uh, what are you in your journey now? I mean, what's next f for you? For, oh, I'm really glad you asked. Yeah. So what we're actually going <laughs> I'm breaking the fourth wall, you see. Um, no, so, so we are, yeah, do more right, is, is, is number one. So um, Europe is an interesting place for e-commerce and for us. So obviously Western Europe, pretty standard. Um, Eastern Europe, we've had experiences where we've turned e-commerce on too quickly and ended up having to turn it back off again, which is not a great experience. So we've developed, um, with Vtex, um, actually, we've developed a kind of a a method of being able to identify when a market is right for us to turn on to e-commerce. So taking uh, you know, on board loads of external factors, but also uh, data that we're gathering from our brand sites. And we've got to a place where we're pretty good at saying, yep, now the time is right. So we're turning on probably two sites every other month at the moment, and then they're starting to, to really deliver from from day one. So although we're in 10 e-commerce sites in EMEA at the moment, I would expect to see that at sort of 20 um, fairly, fairly quickly. Um, the other area for us is marketplaces, which everyone is talking about. But marketplaces is a catch-all term for quite a lot of interesting stuff, I think. So f for us as a, as a smartphone manufacturer or tech manufacturer, um, we don't make cases. Right? We have other people that make cases. But uh, uh, to date, it's been very difficult for us to transact those cases on our sites. So we have been linking out to, uh, you know, um, Amazon or somewhere like that. It's not a great customer experience, not being able to have a single basket. Um, and also, you know, it's not really best practice directing customers out of your website. So at the very base level, creating a marketplace for our partners to be able to transact through our basket, um, but you know, manage all of the fulfillment and everything in the back end, that's important. But also, how do we how do we provide a better service to our existing customers through marketplaces? So a pilot that we're running in Spain at the moment, um, we are working with a retailer there, I'll call it Inglés, where we put our products on their website, and it comes through, you know, they check out through their website, and it's fulfilled uh, through our website. So that's useful for things like different colored devices, so maybe uh, you know, a retailer isn't going to range four different colors, they might range one, but we can share the, the, the remaining colors. Uh, but incidentally, you know, what, what we found was actually in Lenovo, which is our parent company, what they found was um, obviously the partner can see the traffic that's, that's going through that, that website, and they, they quite rightly generate a revenue off the back of that. Um, we had a gaming laptop that they were not interested in ranging at all. Uh, because of this marketplace study, they suddenly saw that there was huge demand for this, and now they've ranged it internally because they, you know, they could see it. So it's, it's kind of like a risk-free um, ability for them to identify what their consumers are, are interested in. So um, marketplaces are, are a big area of, of, of focus for us, for sure. Thanks. Um, the, there's definitely some brands here today who perhaps either have just started their digital commerce journey or thinking or planning on, on doing their digital commerce journey. Given your experience, yeah. James, what lessons or advice could you give to some of the brands that are here today? I think um, you, you need a partner, not, you know, not a company, right? I, I, I was saying to someone earlier on, the, the very first time I met my, my contact in Vtex, he said he was going to be my best friend which is really creepy, but <laughs> it was actually kind of true. I wouldn't say we're best friends, but actually we talk about stuff that's, that's more than just our business relationship. So 
<clears throat> they have, uh, the VTEX team have uh, a, a really broad understanding of our business that expands way beyond what they provide to us as an organization. And because of that, they're able to, we have a brain trust meeting every, uh, every other week where we just kind of you know, share ideas and, and thoughts and stuff. And they, they are hugely um, influential in that meeting because they understand our business. And you know, yes, they're there to, to generate revenue themselves, but it's not about you know, we must sell everything at all costs. It's about kind of being able to see the bigger picture. So for us, that was, that was hugely um, important. The other thing, and I, I touched on it earlier, is I, th I think you need to think about change management, particularly if you're a big organization. For us, it was a, it, I wouldn't say it was a culture shock because I feel like we were, we were prepared that it was going to happen. But fundamentally, we restructured our business internally to cater for e-commerce. And e-commerce, yes, we have big aspirations, but it doesn't represent a huge percentage of our business today. But nevertheless, we restructured the business so that it was comfortable, it works comfortably alongside what we're, what we're doing. It's not a competitor. Um, and, you know, because we have Lenovo as a parent company, that is complicated, but also we get to learn from what they've done. And, and they didn't restructure their business, and I think they, they have seen issues that have arisen as, uh, um, as a result of that, um, which we were definitely able to, um, to learn from. So. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm conscious of time. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, James. No, uh, it's you. been really insightful. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and sharing your insights uh, with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone.